Behind the Shades. So take us through the beginning of your journey and how you ultimately ended up in that situation, Amanda. As with most survivors of human trafficking, uh, we grow up in fairly abusive households. I'm sure you probably have a trigger warning on this episode, so I'm just going to let loose. Um, (laughs) So my mother was emotionally manipulative and abusive. My father was physically abusive, and my brother started molesting me when I was four. That's my entire family, my mom, my dad, my brother, and me. That was our household. So when you're getting it from every single angle, um, there's really no escape. I had no safe place. I was growing up in this household where every single day I wished and prayed that maybe I was actually uh, switched at birth. That was one of the rumors that was going around my family. Or maybe, maybe my real family would come and find me someday. Maybe somebody would come and rescue me. And I kept looking for that. And I grew up in this household. I was molested again when I was 12, again, when I was 13, again, when I was 15, I was raped at 17. And then things got really bad. I wasn't trafficked until I was 18 years old. So, and as you touched on, it could literally be anyone. I was at the time living in Arizona with a boyfriend who was more than twice my age. I was working as a convenience store clerk at a 7-Eleven. I was working my butt off just trying to make ends meet. And this boyfriend had a friend who was going to have a birthday party in Las Vegas. And this guy asked my boyfriend if he could borrow me for his birthday weekend. And he agreed. And the way they presented it to me was I would get a free trip to Las Vegas. And even though I was 18 and I couldn't go gambling, there's plenty to do in Las Vegas, right? There's roller coasters and amusement park stuff and there's Circuit Circus and New York, New York looked just amazing with the roller coasters and all the different arcades and stuff. And I was excited. I wanted to go. And when we got there, we went straight to the hotel where he checked in and he laid some ground rules. I was not to leave the room. If I left the room, I would be abandoned there in Las Vegas. I would not have a way back. I was only allowed to order room service once per day, but the hotel had instructions to leave the cart outside of the room so that nobody would see me and start asking questions as to if I was okay. And I was in that hotel room for 52 hours before we flew back to Arizona. And I don't even want to talk about the things that happened while I was in that room. And the beauty of being as healed as I am is that I don't have to. I can leave it up to uh, the listener's imagination as to how horrible things were. It was one of the most traumatic events of my life. As soon as I got back, I split. I took off. I I couldn't stand to be there anymore. Um, I met some other guy who wanted to rescue me. I hate that word, by the way, rescue, because nobody's truly going to rescue anyone except yourself. They might help you, but you're going to rescue yourself. And this man offered me a place to stay. He was in his 60s and I was 18. And he thought he was going to be my boyfriend. And I wasn't okay with that either. So I I went to Arkansas on a one-week trip to go and visit my grandmother. And I was going to go and stay with her for a little while and just spend Thanksgiving with her that year. And while I was there, I met another man. You can see this pattern forming from one man to another to another. That pattern began when I was quite young with all the molestations, with the rapes, with all of that stuff happening. I started to believe that that was my lot in life. This is who I was supposed to be. I was a sex object for men who were going to do what they were going to do. And why not use that to my advantage rather than letting them take it away from me? Why not just give it to them in exchange for something? So in a way, without receiving monetary compensation, I was prostituting myself without even realizing it. I was being, I I was being in relationships just so that I would not be homeless. And this was a pattern for a long time. So the man I met in Arkansas then 
drove all the way out to Arizona after I had returned. I ended up with really nasty flu that year. He drove all the way out and picked me up and drove all the way back to Arkansas and hid me from my family until I was ready to tell everybody that I was there. And then we got married. He turned out to be abusive. So I was looking for another way out and I met another man. Um, But this one was my boss. I was working at a horse farm at the time. And this man was such a good man. He did not want to take advantage of me or have a relationship like that. He wanted to offer me a safe place to be so that I could stay away from the abuse that I was going through. He recognized it. He was a Vietnam War vet, and that man will forever be one of my heroes. He was amazing. He took me in and gave me his guest house. He gave it to me to use, free charge, nothing. And I continued to work for him until I fell out of a hayloft one day, tore some cartilage in my knee, and needed a surgery. So he wanted to fly me to Florida, where my other grandmother lived, my dad's mother. I was going to stay with her. And while I was getting my knee surgery and recuperating, I could stay there with her and then continue to um, just kind of focus on me for a little while and manage for a bit. And then when I was done with the recuperation, Josh Green was his name. He had another horse farm down in Florida. And he was going to give me a job down there so I could stay away from this abusive man. I got all the way down to Florida and I called my grandmother from the Daytona Beach bus station. Only to have her husband tell me that she wasn't coming to get me. My family, my mother and father specifically called her and told her that if she took me in, they would never speak to her again. So I was abandoned by my entire family at 19 years old in a Daytona Beach bus station at 10 o'clock at night with $5 in my pocket. That was probably one of the scariest moments that I've had. It ranks up there with the trauma of the abuse, the rape, the trafficking. It's up there. If anybody out there has ever gone through that kind of abandonment where your entire family just dumps you on the side of the road. This is something that's really, really difficult to get over, to move past, to understand that your life actually does mean something. And it's not this useless, pointless thing as people have been treating you your whole life. But you do still matter. It's important to recognize that. So this young couple met me at the, tra- at the bus station and they offered me a place to stay. And Adam and Jenny took me back to their house and said, you know, you can stay with us as long as you need to uh, work on getting on your feet. Um, And then we can start talking about rent or you can move, do whatever it is that you need to do. We just want to offer you a place to stay. And what they meant was we're going to offer you this place to stay until we find the highest bidder. Because that's what happened. They sold me to a young man by the name of Esteban, who locked me up for 23 and a half hours with no food, no water, no bathroom facilities. And it was all I could do to keep my sanity for those hours. And I tried to stay awake and I fell asleep at one point. But thankfully, I watched a lot of MacGyver growing up. Richard Dean Anderson is my hero. I've said this a million times and I'll say it a million more. I've written to the man thanking him for having been on that show because it changed my life. And because of Richard Dean Anderson, I was able to get out of that situation and I survived. And it was unbelievable that I survived, but I got out of there and I did not go back for the other people I left behind. And that was the most horrific part for me was that I can still hear them occasionally in my dreams. I can hear them scream out. I can hear one young lady in particular begging for somebody to please help her. Please help me. That was so, awful. Amanda, when you look back on that, because you have a situation where from 18, you said the man was about twice, so you're looking at about 36, almost 40. Mm-hmm. You have older, gen, older man after older man after older man that's playing this type of role in your life. And then previous to all these older men, you have your mother and father who are older as well. Yes. Right? So you have a, and I say children, teenagers are so delicate because 
there's so much going on, right? Six, eight years old, you're, you're vulnerable. But I would say in your teenage years, as you're entering puberty and stuff like that, you're vulnerable in a different way. Mm-hmm. But your adolescent is this, this experience where it's very sexual. It's very over the top to a degree because of everything that you've gone through. And as you mentioned, um, sometimes you didn't know what was going to happen next. Right. I'm when that when that um, couple took you in. When I hear your story, I'm thinking, here's a woman who's been through so much and she still had enough faith in the average person that she went with these people and ultimately it turned out the way it did. When you look back and you mentioned you're in a good space today, how long did it take you to overcome maybe any anxiety or any hesitation you had to people maybe of the older generation or just people in general? It took a long time. Um, there were a lot of events that that happened in my life after that. There were some good people and some bad people that came through it. And I was trafficked one more time. And of everything that I've been through, the man that trafficked me the last time, I knew him for seven years before he trafficked me. So the thing about building relationships with people and wanting to build that trust with somebody, I, I really struggled with that. And I still struggle with that. I have very, very limited friends. I trust my husband completely. He's the greatest man I've ever known in my life. And I've got my best friend. And that's pretty much it. There's not really a whole lot of other people on the planet that I feel like I can trust completely. And it took a long time to get there, too. Not just with being able to trust the people that I do have, but being able to tell myself that it's okay to not trust other people. They haven't proven themselves to me yet. It was, so after Florida, I ended up moving out to California for a little while. And I tried the online dating sites and stuff. You know, that's when they were first starting to gain in some kind of popularity. And I guess it was 2002. I was maybe 2003. I was 23. Uh, so now you can do the math. Now you know how old I am. I'm older than I look. <laughs> but it was probably about 2003. I was on a dating website called hotornot.com. And I met two people at the same time. One of them turned out to later be my ex husband, um, who was not too far from my age. And the other one was a gentleman in Scotland that was just, oh my gosh, he was gorgeous. <laughs> And he was a police officer. I mean, how cool is that? That this police officer wants to get to know me. You know, he wants to hang out with me. He wants to talk to me. And we started emailing back and forth and we became these lifelong pen pals, we thought. He lived all the way over there and I lived all the way in California. It wasn't feasible for somebody like that to have any kind of a relationship. You know, it didn't make sense for us to even pursue that avenue. So I stayed in California, watched his little girl grow up in pictures, and he stayed in Scotland, and he watched my life progressing and watched me climb corporate ladders. Um, We watched each other's progress, and we were each other's best friends, and just for years and years. And he watched my divorces, and he sympathized with me when that divorce failed, and he had been rooting for me, and he wanted me to do well. And later on, I met another cop who was not that much older than me. Um, He was, was, I think Pete was nine years older than me. Anyway, he was older, just not twice my age. (laughs) I was starting to dial it back a little bit by then. (laughs) And he was a highway patrol officer in California. And the guy was fantastic. He was kind and patient and gentle and very sweet, um, very protective. And I liked that about him. But I didn't know myself well enough yet because of everything that I'd been through to be able to talk about what I'd been through. So all he knew was that in some way I was hiding something. In some way I was damaged somehow. And he had no idea how. And I didn't know how to tell him. And that was, I believe, one of the biggest downfalls of our relationship was that I wasn't 100% open with him about all this stuff. I didn't know how to be. I didn't know how to tell myself the truth. How am I going to tell the truth to this guy? So when we split up, 
I found another guy and then another guy and then another guy. And that cycle continued. And finally, Scotland decided he was going to come over and visit me. We'd known each other all these years. He was going to come visit me. And then I was going to go and visit him. And we had these wonderful visits and we absolutely adored each other. And everything was so perfect. And he asked me to get a fiance visa to move over to Scotland and marry him and be with him forever in the land of castles in Scottish Brogue. I mean, what more could somebody ask for, right? This was amazing. What a beautiful gift this was going to be. He loved me. He wanted to be with me. He was another cop, just like Pete had been. So he was going to be safe and comforting and protective, just like Pete had been. And I moved over there and we'd known each other for those seven years. And it took him seven days to start trafficking me. It took him less than two, less than two hours to have my passport, driver's license, my debit card, all that stuff in his possession. And he locked it up in a safe. I had access to nothing. The first seven days were great. He treated me like a princess. You know, that was, that was amazing. I really, I, I loved the treatment I got. I could go anywhere as long as it was with him. I could visit anyone as long as it was his family. Um, I could eat anything I wanted as long as it wasn't going to be too fattening. There were these rules that were already starting to get lined up. And when my body later on through this abuse started rejecting food like red meat, I didn't know I was developing Crohn's disease. And he would focus on mainly feeding me red meat because if I couldn't keep it down, it meant that I would get thinner and I would stay thinner. And that malnourishment I found out later on is absolutely a tactic often used in controlling victims of human trafficking. It makes us weaker. We don't have uh, the same visual reference in the mirror, we start to lose our sense of self. We lose our sense of dignity because we're throwing up all the time. We're sick. We're nauseous. It's easier to manipulate somebody who doesn't know who they are. At one point, I ended up with a kidney infection from the abuse that was so bad that I missed the emergency flight that I had managed to uh, pay for from using my debit card after I conned him into giving it to me, paid for this emergency flight to get out of Scotland less than a month after I got there. And I got so sick with that kidney infection, I ended up in the hospital and I missed my flight. Even if I wasn't in the hospital, I wouldn't have been able to make it to the airport. I thought it was going to die. I was kind of hoping I would. One day I went down to a church. I'd gotten out of the house for a little while. And this church was, oh, it was beautiful, red stone, old, old church in a place called Bells Hill, Scotland. And there, there was this headstone that most of them were so weather-worn that you couldn't even read the date or the names on them anymore. And all I could make out on this one headstone was the year 1776, which Americans, we should know that was the year of independence, right? <laughs> I wanted it to be my year of independence. And so I decided to make friends with that man in the graveyard. I assumed it was a man. I had no idea. And I sat down leaning up against the headstone in that churchyard. And I kept on talking to this person that had been dead for over 200 years and wondering if, if anybody would come and find me in this churchyard. Maybe somebody would come and find me and ask me if I'm okay and ask me if they can help me. I didn't know where to go. And I had no transportation to find an American embassy. I had no identification. I was being trafficked by a police officer and several people who were coming through the house were also police officers and higher up in rank. There was nobody I could turn to. I was so isolated. I was so alone. I wanted to die. So finally, I got up and I walked to the train station. I had every intention of stepping in front of a moving train and dying. That was my plan. And I got to the train station. I was a smoker still at the time. I pulled out my cigarette and I had a book of three matches and I lit my cigarette. And some other man walked out on the, the train platform and he asked me, have you got a light? I said, I do. And I handed him my little book of matches. There's only two left now. And he takes the matches and he 
He thanks me and he lights his cigarette and hands me back the book of matches, which only has one in it now. I said, oh, you can keep it. I, I won't need them anymore. And he had no idea what I meant, but he said, me too. I'm quitting today. I said, oh, that's great. He says, I'm quitting for him. I turn around and look and there's this little boy. He's coming out of the train station building and he walks up to his dad and he holds his hand. And this little boy looked up at me with wisdom beyond his years. And he looked right through me. And I knew I couldn't do what I had set out to do because I would have destroyed that little boy's life. And I had enough people destroy my own childhood. I couldn't do this to that kid too. So I didn't do it. And I walked back to what had been known as my prison for all those months. And I subjected myself to more abuse and more torture. And I put up with it. And I started to try to come up with any other plan that I could and formulate something, some kind of a hope to get me out of there. And finally, I had it. I convinced him that I had Stockholm Syndrome and that I loved him desperately and I'd do anything for him. It was great. <laughs> And I told him, if you send me, if, if you marry me, then I can stay forever. But I don't think that you're wanting to get married, even though I'm here on a fiance visa. And if you don't marry me, then I could get kicked out of the country and never be allowed back because the UK has really strict rules about that kind of stuff. And you could lose your job as a police officer. And you really don't want that. Yes, I do. But yeah, you really don't want that, right? So if you send me back, I can always come back in time for Christmas and it would be our first Christmas together. And wouldn't that be amazing? And he agreed. I was so surprised you can knock me over with a feather. That man went directly to his computer with a glass of whiskey in his hand and he bought a round trip flight. I would have returned December 8th, 2011. I was 31 years old the last time I was trafficked. 31. People paid a premium because I had modeled for Harley Davidson. I was on Alias and Will and Grace, and I'd done all this acting, and he had no idea I was using all that acting against him. I'm proud of that. Very proud of that. I am not a manipulative person, but boy, did I manipulate the pants off of him, so to speak. <laughs> and I got out of there. And when I got back to the States, I don't think I was back even a couple of weeks and I heard some loud commotion on the neighbor's door. And I went and looked through the peephole. And there he was, banging on my neighbor's door, looking for me. In California, nobody really talks to their neighbors. So you don't really get to know those people, which is really handy. Because when he was screaming and he was looking for Amanda, they had no idea, for one, what he was saying because of his Scottish accent. But two, he had no, they had no idea who Amanda was because they had never met me. I'd only been there for a couple of weeks and you don't meet your neighbors out there. So that was handy. But what really turned everything around for me, I would have been perfectly happy hiding the rest of my life, never dealing with anybody, never talking to anybody, being a hermit forever. I would have never talked about any of this. I would have been quiet for the rest of my life. But instead, he got all the photos and the videos that he took of me being raped and molested during those trafficking events. And he put them all into an email and he emailed them to the person who was right then my boss. And he told him, I wouldn't want this in my life, would you? And he destroyed that friendship with my boss. I had known that person for 14 years at that point. I couldn't face that man. I couldn't talk to him. He didn't believe me when I told him that it was forced. Um, that's a huge catalyst for why our friendship ended. I wasn't sure how to deal with that, how to manage that. So I walked out of his life. I refused to have anything to do with him now. Um, and I went and found myself another job, but then he did it again and again and again. And he put up the photos and videos on different photo sharing websites and I couldn't get them pulled down. <laughs> uh, 
And then he added my social media contact information and my address and my phone number and any piece of information he could glean off of the internet. And he made me famous on porn sites while still making money off of me. And that's when I said, I'm done. I'm fighting. If people are going to know who I am, they might as well know the truth behind it. So in 2020, I wrote my full autobiography. It's in talks now of being either a film or a limited series. It was published on June 19th last year on my 10-year anniversary of freedom from human trafficking. I'm very proud. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. That is absolutely amazing because you're here to tell it. And when I, when I hear stories like this or any type of stories with, with trauma, I always find it ins inspirational, inspiring, that the person can still stand tall and still stand strong years later, 10-year anniversary of your freedom, your independence, right? Your version of 1776. Yes, exactly. Right? And this person is, to me anyways, an embodiment of everything that you've gone through in all in one person. They try to impact your past. They try to impact your future while at the same time impacting your present, which is everything that they're doing for you. If I can't have you, no one is. Yes. No one's going to have her as an employee. No one's going to have her as a friend. No one's going to have her as a partner or a spouse, whatever it is that they're trying to do. And when you share this, Amanda, and you understand that you're putting yourself out there and there may be some people like your friend of 14 years who may not truly understand. They may say, well, maybe it wasn't forced, right? And then you have other people that will be very supportive, right? They're in your corner. They have your back, things like that nature. Um, when you got out of that situation all these years later and you're having these conversations, because I know I'm not the first person to speak to you about this. I know you've shared it before. Are you still surprised that there's people out there that were around during that time who aren't necessarily around you today? To some degree. Um, I had gone through enough trauma that I was starting to shut down emotionally in a lot of ways. I pushed a lot of those people out of my life myself before they had the opportunity to push me out of theirs. There was one friend in particular, her name was Sage. She was my roommate. She was the person who came and picked me up at the airport after I left Scotland. She caught wind of something that had happened. I'm not quite sure how. But she started going around and tell, telling people that rather than being a victim of trafficking, I had been a high-priced call girl. It was incredibly painful. She was the one friend I thought I had that I could turn to. And when I lost her, I lost a huge part of what I had gained of my sense of self just by landing back in California after leaving Scotland. I had to leave her behind and I severed all communication. I wanted nothing to do with her. I did share on social media what she had done to me and somebody took it upon themselves to get revenge on her, which to this day, I believe she still blames on me. Um, she ended up losing her job and her home and she ended up having to move back in with her mother um, out of state. She had a rough road. I was cheering for that rough road. I was every bit as cold and calloused as you could imagine because of what I'd been through. How dare you hurt me? Now, anything bad that comes your way, you deserve it. And that's not who I am. That's not who I've ever been. You know, I'm a very forgiving person. I had to come to terms with that and to realize that just because somebody doesn't understand what it is that I'm going through, or what, it, what it is that I went through, it doesn't mean that they're horrible, bad people. It just means that they don't get it and they don't have to. That was, that was definitely a learning curve. Um, when you're not healed enough to be able to accept that people aren't going to always understand the automatic reaction is anger. It's frustration. It's fear. It's, 
struggles with abandonment. But somebody who has moved beyond that can now, I can now look at it and say, yeah, that happened. And that's okay. I'm fine with it. I'm a different person now. I am not my past. My past does not tell me who I am. I tell the world who I am. God tells me who I am. I'm not it anything. doesn't that, define you. Yeah, exactly. And one of the other things that I really struggle with is everybody who tells me, well, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Well, first of all, that's not in the Bible anywhere. Second of all, I am not going to give that kind of credit to the man who did this to me. He doesn't deserve that kind of credit. He did not make me stronger. I was already strong. It already existed in me. I just needed to dig down deep and find it. I was smart enough, strong enough, and crafty enough to figure my way out. He had nothing to do with any of that.